Today I'm going to talk about inductors in DC circuits. In a previous video I talked about capacitors and capacitor time constants, and that video is linked up here and down in the description, and we're going to talk about inductors under the same conditions. So let's review how a capacitor acts under certain conditions, and then see how an inductor acts under those same conditions. So let's draw our test circuit up here. We have a battery, and a switch, a resistor, and a capacitor. And just so we can imagine discharging that capacitor to make sure that there's no energy in it, let's put another switch over here which I will close to make sure that that capacitor is completely discharged. Now we had a 1 volt battery, a 1 ohm resistor, and a 1 farad capacitor. And if we take the resistance times the capacitance, we get a quantity known as the capacitor time constant. That's represented by the Greek letter tau. And the time constant is the time it takes during the charging cycle that we'll review in just a moment, the time it takes for this capacitor to reach 63.2% of this voltage. So if we change our resistance or our capacitor, we will get different quantities for this time constant. Here we have 1 ohm and 1 farad, and so we multiply R times C, we get 1. So that means it will take 1 second for this capacitor to reach 63.2% of this 1 volt. In that case, it will be 0.632 volts. Now if we increase the value of the capacitor, let's say we double that to 2 farads, then it will take 2 seconds for it to reach that 63.2%. And if we double the resistance without doubling the capacitance, we get the same exact thing. And of course, if we double them both, we end up taking four seconds. And as we make them smaller, it will take less and less time. So when we're talking about time constants, we'll be seeing them as being one second throughout this experiment. But remember that that time changes depending on the values of the capacitor and the resistor. So let's get going here and we have an open switch there, a closed switch there. That's to make sure that this capacitor is completely discharged. So now we're going to open that switch, and now we're going to close this one. Okay, at the moment that switch closes, what's going to happen is we're going to get a surge of electrons flowing over to this capacitor, and they're going to pile up. I'll show them as little negative signs here. And the negative charge is going to drive electrons off the other side. So we see electrons going in, and we see the same number of electrons coming out. So what does that look like? It looks like a short circuit. We just see electrons flowing from one side to the other. So at the moment we flip the switch, this capacitor looks like that. Just looks like a piece of wire. Let's put a voltmeter across there. And what's that voltmeter going to read at that moment in time? Well, we have current going through here. How much current do we have? Well, we have one volt and one ohm. Essentially, what's our circuit now? We just have a series circuit with a battery, with a resistor in series, just one battery, one resistor. So we take Ohm's law, and if you know your voltage, you divide into it. So we take our one ohm resistance, divide it into our one volt, and we get one amp of current. And I'll go with conventional current now. So there's our one amp flowing through there. How much voltage do we see? Well, remember that a voltmeter tells us the difference between the voltage at the red lead and at the black lead. And there's a short circuit there. So the red lead is connected to the black lead. There is no difference in the voltage. So we're going to see zero volts. The other way to look at it is we have lots of current, but to get voltage, you need resistance and current. There's no resistance, plenty of current, no resistance. So you must have resistance and current to get voltage. We have no resistance, so no voltage. So that's at the moment we flip that switch. Now, as time goes by, let's get these out of the way and put that capacitor back in there. And we'll stick with conventional current here. We have electricity flowing into the capacitor and it's piling up on this side, driving electricity off the other side. Of course, it's electrons piling up here, driving them off the other side, but we use conventional current because that's what most people use. It's better to wrap your mind around. So electricity is piling up on this side, driving it off that side. So what's happening? As it 
piles up on this side, this is acting like a compressed air tank. It's putting those electrons under pressure and they're starting to push back. So we're starting to get some voltage across here. So as time goes by, we start to get some voltage and that voltage increases. And after one second, what is that voltage? Well, our time constant is one second, one ohm times one farad. So one second is our time constant. By definition, a time constant is the time it takes for this voltage to reach 63.2% of that. So after one second, we have 0.632 volts across the capacitor. Now, as time goes by, we have five seconds go by our five time constants. This voltage is going to get pretty close to that voltage. After five time constants, it's about 99%, so it's going to be 0.99 volts. And it's going to get closer and closer and closer to this. So after five time constants, this is essentially reached that voltage. So what's this capacitor to look like now? It sort of looks like a battery because now we've got all this charge on here. We've got one volt across it. We have all that energy stored in there and in an electric field, it looks like compressed electricity. And so this now looks like a battery pushing back with, let's get the voltmeter out of the way just so we can draw the circuit this way. We have one volt pushing this way one volt pushing that way they're both hitting each other and nobody's going anywhere so once that capacitor is fully charged there's no longer any current flowing through so the capacitor looks like exactly what it is which is two conductors separated by an insulator and of course we have our full voltage across them now it's not like a battery because it doesn't have the chemical energy store so it's going to discharge very quickly when we discharge it but it does have the energy there and does have that resemblance so that's what happens in the charge cycle. When we flip the switch, the capacitor first looks like a short circuit. After one time constant, in this case one second, we reach 63.2% of that voltage, which was 0.632 volts. And then after about five time constants, five seconds in our case, this has essentially reached that voltage and they're pushing opposite directions, no currents flowing. The capacitor now looks like an open circuit. Now that we've got that all charged up, let's see what happens when we discharge it. So let's get these current arrows out of the way because there's no more current flowing in there. Now we're going to open the switch, taking that battery out of the circuit, and we're going to close the switch. Now at the moment we close that switch, what do we have now? This part of the circuit's no longer connected because we've taken that open that switch here and so we just have a one volt voltage source and a one ohm resistor and so current is going to flow that's going to be positive to negative current will flow conventional current will flow in that direction and so what do we have one volt one ohm and we have one amp but the current is flowing the opposite direction now and we call that a negative current so i'm going to talk about negative current in a moment just remember, negative current just means the current's flowing in the opposite direction. It's not some kind of strange entity. Positive current means it's flowing this way. Negative current means it's flowing that way. So now we have a negative one amp of current. As time goes by, that's going to discharge. And now after one time constant, we are going to lose 63.2%. So on the way up, in our first time constant, we gained 63.2% of the source voltage. Now we're going to lose that. So we start at one volt and we go down to 36.8% or 0.368 volts after one second. And then after about five time constants, that's completely discharged. There's no more energy there. So no voltage, no current, and we're back where we started. So let's take a look at that on a graph. So here we have our voltage. I'm going to do our voltage in green. But we're also going to show our current on this graph. So we're going to show two different things, current and voltage. And we're going to have a maximum of one volt. So let's draw that right up here, one volt. And we're also going to have a maximum of one amp. So I'll put that right next to it. So up here is one amp and one volt. Down here, of course, is zero. And our time is going to be across here. So 
what we'll do is we'll make these time constants. So I'll just put a little tau here. One, two, three, four, five. Remember that the time constant is the time it takes to charge to 63.2% of the source voltage. And that time constant is simply your resistance multiplied by your capacitance. So in our case, that time constant is one second. So no time constants, one time constant is equal to one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and five seconds. I'll just put S here for seconds in parentheses to remind us that with this combination of resistor and capacitor, we have one second is one time constant. So now we're going to flip that switch. Let's draw the circuit up here for a moment just to remind us of what we're doing. Okay, so we just flipped that switch. What's the capacitor look like? Looks like a short circuit. So we have current flowing through here. We have one volt, one ohm, and one farad. So at the moment we flip the switch, what do we have? We have an amp of current. So I'll just put a little red dot up here to represent our one amp of current. And our voltage is zero because that looks like a short circuit. So that's how things are at the moment we flip the switch. Now after one time constant, what's going to happen? Well, our voltage is going to increase to 63.2% of the source voltage. So that went up to, let's see, I would put that right about there, 0.632 volts. So that has climbed up to 0.632 volts. And I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but after every time constant, we gain 63.2% of what's left. So we're at 0.632. So we subtract that from one and we're going to get 63.2% of the difference and that will give us the next voltage and it's going to be 85 or something like that. I just don't remember off the top of my head. But look at the video about capacitors if you want to know the exact numbers or you can calculate it out. So that's going to go up to a slightly higher voltage and after time goes by eventually at five time constants we are all the way up to essentially one volt. What's the current done through this time? Well, as this voltage goes up, it resists the flow of current more and more. So after one time constant, our current has dropped down. We have lost 63.2% of our current. So we're down to 0.368 amps. Started out at one amp, now we've dropped down to 0.368 amps. And then after another time constant, we lose 63.2% of what's left. And that drops down so when we get to five time constants, we have one volt across the capacitor and no current flowing through it. Now we're going to open the switch and close that one. And what happens? Now we have one volt over here. I'll put my one farad back, one volt. And the current's going to start flowing the opposite way through that resistor. So we're going to get a negative current. Just simply means it's flowing the opposite direction. But on the graph, we go down here. And I don't have enough room here. But it goes down to minus 1 amp. Negative amps just means it's flowing the opposite direction. And as time goes by, that current is going to go back up towards 0 as the voltage. Now i got to get this out of the way here. As the voltage drops down... It discharges after one time constant, we're down to 0.368 volts. And after one time constant here, we're down to point negative 0.368 amps. And eventually we get down to where there's no voltage and no current. So that's what happens with a capacitor. So let's draw our circuit back up there again. Okay, and just quick review, when I flip the switch, at first it's a short circuit, then after a while it's an open circuit. Okay, now what we're going to do is replace our capacitor with a 1 Henry inductor. 
So now we're one volt, one ohm, and one Henry. Now, is there a such thing as a inductor time constant? A resistor inductor time constant? Yes, there is. Do we ever talk about it? No, we don't. But I'm going to talk about it now because this will give us insight into what the inductor does compared to the capacitor. So the inductor time constant, which I'll also represent with the Greek letter tau, is equal to the inductance divided by the resistance. And in this case, it's going to be 1 Henry goes into 1 ohm. Actually, it's going to be 1 ohm goes into 1 Henry, and we end up with 1 second again for our time constant. So now what happens? I'm going to flip this switch, and now what happens? Current tries to flow into the inductor. What does an inductor do when we push current into it? The magnetic field builds up, and as that magnetic field is moving, as it builds, it induces a current inside the inductor, we call that self-induction, which pushes back against the current that's being pushed in. We call that back EMF, or back voltage. So the inductor pushes back at least as hard as the current going in. And it can actually push harder, but we'll just say just at least as hard. It depends on how fast that magnetic field is allowed to build. So it's pushing back as hard as that's pushing in, so we get no current flow. So at this stage, when we flip that switch, the capacitor looked like a short circuit. But the inductor blocks the current flow, so the inductor looks like an open circuit, just the opposite of the capacitor. And if we put a voltmeter across here, what do we get? We get our full voltage, just like you do across any open circuit. So there's no voltage drop because there's no current. So we have one volt here. We have a resistor here. Do we have a voltage drop? No. We have resistance, but no current. So we start with one volt. We don't lose any voltage. We are left with one volt over here. So that looks like a normal open circuit. Now, after time goes by, that magnetic field starts to slow down. And so current starts to flow. So we start to get a little current through there. And as it slows down, it's not producing as much back EMF, so this voltage starts to drop. And after one time constant, it's going to drop down to 0.368 of the original. And then after about five time constants, this magnetic field is going to be completely built. It's no longer moving, and remember that magnetic field only pushes back while it's building up. When it stops, it no longer pushes back. So current flows freely through here. Now, this inductor looks like what it is, just a piece of wire. So the capacitor, when we flip the switch, looked like a short circuit. But after five time constants, it looked like what the capacitor is, two inductors separated by an insulator, an open circuit. The inductor acts just the opposite. You flip the switch, it looks like an open circuit. But after time, it becomes exactly what the inductor is, just some wire. And it does have a little bit of resistance, depending on how much resistance is in the wire. So if we have an inductor made with heavy wire, it's going to have less resistance. But many, many turns of small wire, it's going to have more resistance. And so, as a matter of fact, if we do this time constant thing, we have to factor in the resistance of the inductor to our total resistance. OK, so the inductor acted exactly backward to the capacitor. Now let's see what happens. Let's clean this up a little bit here. So now our magnetic field is all built up. Put a voltmeter across here. We're going to have some small voltage. Let's say depends on how much current we have. So how much current do we have? It depends on how much resistance we have here, but it's going to be something less than one amp because we have one ohm and one volt. That'll give us one amp. Whatever resistance is in the inductor is going to increase that resistance. So we have something less than one amp. And I'll just put here a hundredth of a volt just because I can. Depends on the amount of resistance in the inductor. Now what we're going to do is simultaneously open that switch and close that switch. What's going to happen? Well, as it was building up its magnetic field, we had current flowing in this way and current flowing out that way. So there's our conventional current flowing into the component that is resisting the flow. So what happens here? Well, we get the current going in, we get a backup of voltage. It's like water trying to go down a slow drain. We get a backup behind the slow drain. 
So we're going to get higher and higher voltage here, which we label as positive and negative. So as it's charging, or as the magnetic field is building up, we get a voltage across here that's positive to negative. Now, when we open this switch and close that one, what's going to happen? That magnetic field is going to start collapsing. And what does it do? It feeds energy in and it keeps the current going. So now the current is going this way, but the inductor is now taking energy stored in that magnetic field and pushing it into the current. So the inductor has now become a current source. So we look at the battery, which is a current source, and the conventional current comes out of the positive side. But in the inductor, the current is going that way, so it's coming out of the positive side. So at the moment I flip these switches and start discharging this, the polarity of the voltage across that inductor flops. So it was positive to negative, now it's negative to positive. So now we have a negative voltage on there. Negative voltage, of course, is just a voltage that's lower than some other voltage that we've labeled as zero. But if we have a voltmeter on here, what's it going to do? It's going to register a negative number if we flip the voltage across there. And if we do this with an oscilloscope, the voltage line is going to drop down to a negative level. And if the oscilloscope is reading over time, we're going to see it suddenly drop down and then whatever happens after that. Okay, so at the moment we open that, we get a negative voltage. So with the capacitor, when we opened the switch and started discharging, we got a negative current. Now with the inductor, we open it and start discharging, the polarity flips, so we get a negative voltage. And then as time goes by, this voltage is going to get lower and lower, and the current is going to get lower and lower as that magnetic field collapses and we lose energy, and eventually we're back down to zero. So let's draw our graph like we did before. So here's our time constants, which is going to be one second each again, because that's what we're doing. Because we have one Henry and one Ohm. One, two, three, four, five. So there's zero, one, two, three, four, five time constants. And we're going to be over here with our voltage and our current. And that's going to be up at our maximum voltage here, which is going to be one volt in this case. So what's going to happen? Let's look at the capacitor again, just remind ourselves. So at the capacitor, the voltage climbed up and up and up. And then when we flipped that switch, the voltage went back down. But what did the current do? The current went down to zero. Then when we flipped that switch, the current went negative and then did like that. Well, with the inductor, we get exactly the opposite. The easiest way to do this will be just to flip these over here. Now the red is our voltage and the green is our current. So what we have is the voltage goes down, 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 and the current goes up, up, up. When we flip the switch, the voltage flips polarity and they gradually go back down to zero. So the inductor and the capacitor act exactly opposite to each other in a DC circuit. Now let's go back to our circuit and take a look at another thing that can happen with inductors. Battery, switch, resistor. And I'm gonna move that resistor over. You'll see why in a moment. Inductor. And I'm going to put our discharge switch over here. So when we're discharging, if you will, when we're collapsing that magnetic field, the resistor is no longer part of the circuit. So here's our, let's make this 10 volts just because we can. Uh, one ohm, one Henry. I just want to use a higher voltage. Didn't have to, but here we go. So we've got our maximum current going through here now. In our maximum magnetic field, everything is stable. And now what I'm going to do is suddenly open this switch and close that switch. And what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that magnetic field is going to collapse very quickly. And 
we can actually get a higher voltage across here because of the speed of the collapse of that magnetic field than the voltage we put in. So maybe 50 volts across there instead of just the 10. So we can get a big spike of voltage, maybe even bigger than that, when we do that. As a matter of fact, uh, if we eliminate that resistor, let's just make a slightly simpler circuit here. And we'll talk about what Joseph Henry was doing with these. So we have that switch closed. Joseph Henry had an electromagnet, which means he had this inductor with some soft iron in there to concentrate the magnetic field and used it to pick up things or to attract uh, ferrous metals, open the switch and it would release them. And what he saw, let's draw the magnetic field here, is when he opened that switch, he got a spark across it. And at first he thought it was because the electricity had momentum, but then realized what was happening is that the collapsing magnetic field was actually inducing the current which produced enough voltage across here to ionize the air. And so like I said, that voltage can be much bigger. I'll just say 50 volts again, but it could be even bigger. And so we can get these voltage spikes when we suddenly stop the current through an inductor. Now that can be useful or it can be detrimental. For one thing, it's going to start wearing out the electrodes on the switch. So one thing we might do is put a capacitor across that switch, which means that when we open it, what's the capacitor going to look like at that moment? It's going to look like a short circuit for a moment and then quickly build up. And so it's going to cause the voltage to gradually increase. It's going to cause this magnetic field to decrease a little slower by putting the capacitor in there. Another thing, which I'm getting ahead of things a little bit here, talking about uh, solid state circuits, but another thing you might see is where we have an inductor, where we might cut off the electricity real quick. You might find that there is a diode across that inductor with the cathode here and the anode there. And since we haven't talked about those yet, I'll just quickly tell you what this is. This is a check valve. Electricity can flow that way, but it cannot flow that way. So when the inductor is in its building cycle, the current is flowing this direction. Our voltage is positive to negative. Nothing's going to happen here. This acts like an open switch. But when we flip this switch open and that magnetic field quickly collapses, what happens? our polarity suddenly changes and that turns this on. Now this looks like a check valve. This becomes a short circuit and prevents a high voltage from developing across that uh, inductor. So when we stop the current through an inductor rapidly, we can get high voltages across it, voltage spikes. That's one of the causes of, you hear about voltage spikes all the time. Where do voltage spikes come from? How about stopping the current through an inductor suddenly? That'll give you voltage spikes. So there's a couple of ways to mitigate them. But we can also make use of that. As I mentioned, that voltage can be considerably higher than that voltage, and we can capture that. There's a device called a buck converter. I'm not going to try to draw it here because that's way beyond where we are in the class. But a buck converter takes advantage of the fact that when we open that switch, we get a bigger voltage here than we originally put across it. And by putting uh, diodes in the right place and uh, have an oscillator, which basically opens and closes the switch rapidly and put a diode in there the right way, we can actually build a circuit that gets a higher voltage. So let's say, if I can draw this. So a buck converter, I'll just put a BC there for buck converter, simply uses a single coil and that property of getting a higher voltage when you de-energize it to build up the voltage. Now, if you know a little bit about AC, you might say, well, don't you do that with transformers? Yeah, transformer will do that, but a transformer takes two coils. A buck converter only takes one, so it's a cheap and dirty way to get a higher voltage. And then we have some rectification to make that back into a DC voltage. So there's where we take advantage of the higher voltage when we collapse the magnetic field where there's ways to mitigate it if that is a problem. Another thing we do with inductors and DC circuits is use it to mitigate changes in voltage. Remember that an inductor acts like a flywheel. It's hard to get current to go through it, but once the current is going through, it's hard to stop it. In other words, it does not like changes in current. So let's say we have a circuit over here uh, where there's a voltage that's fluctuating. It's going up and down over time. So time is horizontal and voltage is vertical. 
and we don't want that getting to some other circuit. Let's say this is a, a radio frequency circuit, which means these voltages are going up at very rapidly. And over here we have an audio circuit. That should be AF, audio frequencies. And we don't want these radio frequencies getting over here and causing artifacts in the audio frequency circuit. So what do we do between those? How about put a coil in between them? And when we do that, we would usually call this a choke coil. So we have DC flowing between the two circuits, but this coil will prevent the fluctuations at the radio frequencies will not go through the coil because it doesn't like changes. As the voltage goes up, the current goes up, the magnetic field builds and that pushes back. As the voltage goes down, the magnetic field collapses and that pushes the other way and it keeps the current going steady. The inductor does not like changes in current. And if we do this at lower frequencies, such as a filter and a power supply, we might call that a filter. So they do pretty much the same thing. They block fluctuations in one circuit from getting to another, but depending on the frequencies involved, if it's high frequencies to lower frequencies, such as radio to audio, we'll call that a choke. But if it's like a power supply that converts AC to DC, we have residual alternating current over here, we don't want getting over to here, then we would call that a filter. But they do the same job. Now, when we get into alternating current, we're going to find a lot of other uses for them, such as uh, making oscillators and filters and other circuits. But you've seen what they might be used for in DC circuits. So for a quick review, an inductor does not like changes in current. It acts like a flywheel. The flywheel, if you can think of a potter's flywheel, it's a big, heavy concrete wheel. It takes a lot of work to get it going. And as you get it going, it stores more and more energy, and then it's hard to stop. An inductor, if we try to push current into it, it's hard to get current to go through an inductor because it pushes back when you push current in. But after a while, the current starts to go through, and it's able to go on through, but then if you try to stop it, the magnetic field collapses, which feeds energy in and tries to keep it going. So it has that flywheel effect. And the other interesting thing worth mentioning, of course, is that if we get current going through an inductor, so there's current going through it, we get our magnetic field. And remember, conventional current enters in this side, so voltage backs up, so we get our positive here and our negative there. But when we stop that current and that magnetic field starts to collapse, the inductor goes from being a current consumer to a current source. And so the current continues to go through, but now, as any source, the positive side is where the current comes out. And so when we stop that current, when we try to stop that current, and this goes through its collapsing cycle, the voltage polarity across it flips. And remember that when we collapse that magnetic field, we can actually get more voltage out of this coil than we actually put in. So we can make use out of that in such things as buck converters, or we may have to mitigate that because we can get sparks across contacts or voltage spikes that can damage circuits. So the fact that we can get a bigger voltage across an inductor than what we put into it may have to be mitigated or taken advantage of. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.